Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Critics, and of course, my Underwater Train Finders. You are the reason why this content remains! Play God. <laughs> and today, we are going to discuss more locomotives that are somewhat in the realm of mad science experiments. These are five more trains that are clearly just mad science experiments, like I just said. Weren't you listening? Pay attention! There'll be a test later! The London and South Western Railway C-14 class. Now, to be fair, this is kind of loose in terms of the mad science element, because there's nothing really unconventional about the C-14. I just kind of picture it as the mad scientist getting really bored and wishing for an adorable sidekick, like Gurr, or something like that, you know? These are two 20 tank locomotives, and they were meant to work push-pull trains on lightly used lines in 1907. Now, based on the size and wheel arrangement, you might already be able to realize exactly what the problem is with these. Well, they're very, 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 very small. So small, in fact, that they were significantly underpowered, and their attractive effort might as well have been non-existent. They couldn't pull anything. Attempting to use them on push-pull trains just wasn't working, and they were eventually relegated to simple, small shunting duties, which, with one car at a time at low speeds, they could kind of handle that, but they still weren't exactly the most useful things in the world. An attempt was made to fix them by rebuilding them into the S14s, which were 040Ts, but even this didn't actually fix the problems. True, now they had more driving wheels, but they were still light, very light, and their actual power output wasn't any better so it didn't actually fix the problem. Weirdly though, a handful did survive way, way longer than you would expect. Three of them wound up being used as dock shunters and weren't actually withdrawn until 1959. So I guess they found some level of use for them. The Refractory Brick Firebox Locomotive. This was actually attempted more than once, and now we're really getting into the realm of weird. You're looking at a Belgian locomotive that was constructed in 1894. From its wheel arrangement, it's a 260, so it's actually a mogul. But, well, you're probably really confused by, well, a lot of what you're seeing. For one thing, that's a steam reservoir behind the chimney, and that was meant to work with the weird way the firebox was set up in this particular locomotive. Now what in the heck is a refractory brick, and what does that have to do with a firebox? Well, refractory bricks are just another name for fire bricks, which are quite literally bricks, but they're usually made of some kind of ceramic specifically to retain heat. The way this worked was bizarre at best, because it wasn't just that they made the firebox out of these bricks. It wasn't surrounded by water either, which sounds alarmingly dangerous, but given the way this operated, it was actually all right. There was only air around the firebox, and that hot air that was heated by the bricks was used to supply the furnace and therefore heat the steam. It sounds really bizarre because it is, and there were actually a few examples of it, though this one, number 512, was the one that I found the most information on. It was built in 1894 and retired in 1906, which doesn't bode well for anything involving this locomotive. The thing about the brick fireboxes is that they were really prone to malfunction, from the shock and vibration of a locomotive. So there's a reason you don't see them very often, if ever. They just didn't work very well. They were difficult to steam, they had a lot of condensation in the cylinders, and they had very high coal consumption. Perhaps an interesting experiment, sure, but definitely something that was proven not to really work that well. The Hurricane. Oh boy, now we're getting into real crazy stuff. What the heck is that? Why is it, what the, why? anything. There's no reason for this. Now, it may be a bit hard to judge scale from this drawing, as as far as I'm able to tell, there's actually no known pictures of this thing, as it was built for the Great Western Railway around 1838. Now, despite having a total of 16 wheels, only two of them were driving wheels. 
Now I want you to guess which ones they were. Of course, I don't know what you expected. That's right, the giant 10 foot driving wheels were the only thing that moved this thing along. Now as a result, anyone familiar with locomotive design could tell you that this probably actually didn't work very well at all. Not only are there just not enough driving wheels for how long this thing would be, but the driving wheels aren't even underneath the boiler. So most of the locomotive's weight is on six of the unpowered wheels right in the center, which is where you think the driving wheels would be. But allegedly, the Hurricane was so named because it achieved 100 miles per hour on a 28 mile test run in September of 1839. Now, there's no direct evidence that that's true. In fact, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that that is a vile and odious lie. There's no way this thing could go 100 miles per hour. What, did you push it off a cliff and let it reach terminal velocity? I mean, maybe I believe that. Between the overall size of it, the two giant driving wheels that are not where the heaviest part of the locomotive actually is, and just the primitive nature of steam technology in the late 1830s, there's just no chance it ever got that fast. I'd be shocked if it reached 20 miles per hour, frankly. Speaking of poor weight distribution, though... The Nichols Boiler. Oh my no. Who thought that was a good idea? I probably should explain what you're looking at, though. Because maybe you're looking at this to see what's wrong. I mean, that just looks like a tender to locomotive. Look closer. Look very close and understand what you are looking at. All right. You have a pretty normal looking locomotive in the front, except for the fact that that's not a boiler there. That is just a steam reservoir. The boiler is the tender. Oh yes. This literal dead end in locomotive technology development was built in 1846 by Mr. G.A. Nichols who was the chief engineer at the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. He wanted to burn anthracite coal, but at the time, they were struggling with this. They needed a very wide grate in order for it to burn effectively, which is fine, but the solution was not, not advised. The boiler and pretty much all the major locomotive functions were done in the tender behind it. The steam was channeled into the reservoir in the front where the normal looking locomotive is and then it would power the eight driving wheels that way. Now, it could actually move, to be fair, but this is just so wrong on so many levels. There's basically no weight on the drivers at all, at all. All of it is behind it in the tender because that's where he put the boiler. So this locomotive's track adhesion was horrible, absolutely atrocious, but that wasn't actually its only issue. They didn't create boiler drought in the same way as a typical boiler would. Instead, they used a steam-driven fan, which supplied positive pressure into the firebox. Now, that's okay, except for the little, slight, teensy-weensy, minor issue. That the fan would actually cause flames to blast out of the firebox. So the only way to actually give the boiler more fuel was to shut that fan off. So they found it was actually necessary to damp down the fire between stations. Definitely not an efficient design in any regard. The Belgian Franco Costi locomotive. Oh boy, I'm a little excited to tell you about this. Because you are not going to believe it. I hope you're sitting comfortably for this example of precision Belgian engineering. For what we have here is definitely a strange locomotive that took an example of the Franco Costi boiler design. Do you want to know what this wheel arrangement is? Because you are so not ready for it. All right. It is a 0, 6, 2, plus 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, plus 2, 6, 0. Now, if you think about that for a second, you may realize what we're looking at. Oh, yes. You are looking at the one. The only ever built. Quadruplex steam locomotive. They did it. The absolute madmen in Belgium actually built a quadruplex. And it, well, admittedly, it turned out a bit better than I think it had any right to. The Rico Crosti system actually kind of worked well for a quadruplex, especially given how large it was. It was 31 meters long. It was double-ended because there was no way they were ever going to put this on any turntable ever. And there was a water wall between the two fireboxes. Yes, there were two fireboxes, which meant there were two firemen. This, of course, inflated operating costs with this thing, and it's one of its biggest faults. First of all, it's huge, so it's going to be expensive to run just because of that. 
but you also have to pay extra workers to manage it too. Franco Crosti's boiler system is actually somewhat efficient in some ways, though it never really took off. Believe it or not, despite being a quadruplex, it was actually a remarkably stable locomotive. And that's because, if you couldn't tell, it's articulated. Which, I mean, it would almost have to be if it's that long, so fair enough, good call. And apparently its maximum speed that it was allowed to go at was 60 kilometers an hour. Which was a little slow for steam engines of that era, but faster than I would have expected from a quadruplex. However, despite being built in 1932, it was out of use by 1935. They only really utilized it for about three years. Well, why? Well, simply put, there was no reason for this outside of UNSPEAKABLE POWER! <laughs> Trains of the 30s were not nearly long enough to justify this unbridled madness we got going on here. In fact, the locomotive was so powerful that it could have potentially broken the couplers they would have been using. Power is nice in some aspects, but you have to factor it in with management costs. There was no purpose for this. None. From the looks of it, they might have built it just to see if they could. And to be fair, they did it. Good work. I'm impressed. But they had no reason for a locomotive so large, so powerful, and so full of unstoppable fury. As far as what happened to it, well, it was kind of disassembled. The twin firebox boiler was sold. However, pieces of it were actually used to make two different locomotives later that were used by Germany at the end of 1943. At the end of World War II, however, they came under Soviet control. And this is where things got a little crazy, and I would have loved to see it, but as far as we know, the Soviets never actually committed to this plan. They were going to use the tech to go bigger. Because of course they were. And they were going to make a hexaplex. But they never actually built it. Which, I am sad. I'm glad I was able to tell you that there was once a quadruplex locomotive on this plane of existence. But I don't believe I'll ever be able to tell you that there was a hexaplex. But man, it would have been cool. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitchen 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Vaughn, farewell.